we're going to be examining is going to be um, specifically addressed at what are termed dynamic decision problems or dynamically complex decision problems. Um, we are going to be using this lecture to introduce thinking as to how strategic levels of uncertainty might affect the sort of modeling we've been pursuing within this class. And particularly to introduce a construct used for characterizing um, decision making under uncertainty, under unfolding uncertainty, uncertainty that plays out over time. Situations where rather than simply making a decision ahead of time, you need to actually observe and react to events as they play out in order to, to undertake decisions in the most effective fashion. So we're going to be introducing this construct of decision trees within this context to reason about choices under uncertainty. And we'll see how these decision trees can be combined with simulation models of the sort that, that we're seeing uh, yeah, within this class. So, um, and I again uh, apologize. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. okay, this is great. This is great. Thank you. Um, I've got two power adapters just in case things get really bad. Um, it's, been a, it's been a rough day already, and um, it's nice to have insurance. Okay, um, so uh, the slides here, again, are going to be kind of messed up due to the, the issues with this uh, different display format. Um, what I will do is just dynamically react to it and, uh, and kind of uh, format it differently. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, this, is, this is looking uh, interesting. Okay, why can't I? Oh, great. Um, okay, well, um, I'll sacrifice aesthetics for function as I am want. Um, okay, here we go. Um, there we go. So the, the, the problem that I'm going to be introducing today uh, as a motivating example is this problem of, of uh, it's, a, it's a health issue called West Nile infection. Does anyone know about West Nile infection? Does anyone know anything about it? So what is it, give me, give me a few things that come to mind when we talk about West Nile. Is it something that uh, only exists in uh, the west part of the Nile in Africa? No, it's a problem here in Saskatchewan. What does it involve? Mosquitoes, yeah. So you may have heard some advisories on TV or radio or newspapers um, from the health regions or from the Ministry of Health warning about contact with mosquitoes. Um, uh, and it turns out that Saskatoon Health Region, our local health region here, um, had a uh, quite high burden of, of West Nile um, uh, within the uh, past decade, um, particularly for the year 2007. But at the same time, the large majority of years over this time period, there's been almost no measured illness. Um, and, okay, so there might be you know, a, a couple of cases. Um, and uh, we're talking about a, a gap of several orders of magnitude from what we saw in 2007, where the number of cases was very, very high, over 1,000. Okay? And the question here, in, in dealing with a problem like this, is how do we plan uh, effectively, put plans into place when there's huge differences in terms of what we need to do or what's best to do from year to year? Um, and the risks from year to year are only known incrementally. So I want to talk a little bit about, about this health issue because it will help to understand and, and situate sort of the use of these two types of modeling in this context. Um, so uh, West Nile is spread via mosquitoes. And it turns out that West Nile-bearing uh, mosquitoes that bite people can transmit this nasty bug. Okay? Um, this is a bug that was introduced into uh, the US uh, uh, some years back. I think it was in right around the turn of the century or so. Um, Cheryl might know, but I think it was around 2000-ish, something like that, 99. Um, and it was actually, seems to have been brought to North America by an animal in the Bronx Zoo. And mosquitoes bit this animal 
And then they started biting other things as they are wont. Um, so they bit, they bit uh, some, uh, some crows, and, and the crows, as, as I recall from the early reports, there were, there were crow deaths early on. Um, but uh, there were also some early on cases in humans um, that were caused, it seems, in that area of the Bronx, uh, the Bronx where the zoo was. And from that point, it spread out across the US and eventually into Canada, including Saskatchewan. And Saskatchewan is distinguished as having the highest recorded, at least until the past few years, uh, maybe even until now, highest recorded amounts per person of West Nile virus in some of the years. In 2007 in particular, it was a, it was a very, uh, it was the highest in, in North America. And so mosquitoes can bite people, but the people don't, don't spread the bug. The mosquitoes don't catch it from people. Uh, in contrast to malaria, the mosquitoes deliver it to people, and they're what are called a dead end host. It doesn't move on from them, um, but it can kill you. West Nile virus can kill you. It can also cause paralysis. It can also cause uh, uh, encephalitis and meningitis, sort of infections of the brain and of the spinal cord. And um, it can cause very unpleasant symptoms in a much larger number of people, such as uh, intense headaches or, or distortions to vision or what have you. Um, West Nile can also bite other animals like horses, which are dead end hosts, but I think it's it has a greater chance of being um, uh, being fatal to a horse than it does to a person. Um, so there's actually a higher number of, of, of horse fatalities on a per animal uh, basis that, that's been. But where it really thrives is in its interaction with birds. It turns out birds, when, when a West Island mosquito, bearing, bearing mosquito bites a bird, um, the birds develop very high levels of virus in their body, what's called viremia. And, and then the mosquito can catch it from a bird as well. So birds become this reservoir where they can get infected from a mosquito and then they can spread it to other mosquitoes. So they're, they're a key component in, in spreading, spreading it. And there's a life cycle associated with mosquitoes that ends up affecting their development that's quite staged. The mosquitoes lay eggs, they develop into larvae and pupae, and then they come out into the air and uh, bite animals and uh, sometimes people, um, as, we, as we all know. Um, so there's a lot of things that affect this life cycle in mosquitoes. Um, temperature ends up affecting a lot of them, egg laying, the number of blood meals taken, how often they bite, and the number of bites per blood meal. Um, the maturation of these, these uh, small um, mosquito and, and the aqueous environment in ponds and sloughs, et cetera. And, um, and then how quickly the virus matures in the gut of the mosquito. Um, it also turns out that uh, rainfall, um, partly because of this habitat availability issue, uh, can end up affecting mosquito populations. So if there's lots of recent rainfall, um, it can form these little puddles and so on. Um, you can have enclosed environments like water inside of tires, which, which end up forming ideal habitats for mosquitoes. So mosquitoes are affected by temperature and by rainfall to a lesser degree in, in, in to a lesser degree here um, in, in big ways. Um, now, it turns out there's some other things affecting people's likelihood of getting West Nile virus infection. Um, their perception of the risk. So what could you do to shield yourself from West Nile virus infection if you're a person? Stay inside. Stay inside is one thing, good. You're less likely to stay inside if it's really warm out and pleasant. You're more likely to stay inside if it's really roasting out. Saskatchewan is one of the few jurisdictions worldwide, or, or a smaller number worldwide, where it can go from minus 40 to plus 40, um, not in a day. No. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but minus 40 is as it seems like it, right? Uh, minus 40 to plus 40 in the course of a year. And if it's really, really hot, you're unlikely to go outside. But if it's a really pleasant temperature, um, you know, it's more likely to be drawn outside. So what's another thing you can do to protect from West Nile? Yeah, wear appropriate clothing. So long sleeves, long pants. Um, 
uh, you have uh, you have protective uh, uh, protective um, you know uh, mosquito closing if you're if you're out in, in high high numbers uh, for a long time in mosquito infested areas. Um, so so that's important, and that takes a certain amount of risk perception that I might be exposed, and so you you put on this protective closing. What else could you do? We had a group last year was looking at the evidence of it, in fact, in this class. Found some interesting patterns. Mosquito what a, what is that? Mosquito repellent? Mosquito repellent. Yeah, so they were actually, they had a time series from all across Saskatchewan of um, amounts of bug repellent that were bought in uh, pharmacies across Saskatchewan. And they were looking at how that changed week to week in relation to advisories and in relation to um, reported cases uh, of, of West Nile or, or other factors. There were, there were a number of factors involved. And they were looking at how people purchased mosquito repellent as kind of a proxy for how it was used. And finally, knowledge of West Nile might, might increase, uh, in, increase your sense of perceived risk. So the challenge here is, you know, year to year, there's orders of magnitude difference in the number of cases of West Nile. And so the best policy for one year is, might be incredibly wasteful for another or dangerous for another, you know, um, either taking really aggressive action that might not in the end be needed, costs a lot of money in a fiscal environment that's quite tight right now, or doing nothing may be really dangerous in a year that's looking problematic in terms of mosquito numbers um, and the prevalence of West Nile. So the big challenge here, and this is indicative of all the types of, um, the real focus of today's discussion is, you need to make decisions now, given uncertainties regarding future developments, how the mosquito population will be changing, both in abundance and the, the, the frequency with which mosquitoes are, are, uh, are infected by West Nile, and in light of uncertainties about the environmental conditions that might drive mosquito population. So for many years, and, and perhaps it's still happening, there were bug busters meetings that were occurring every week in the health regions, basically looking at mosquito populations and uh, particularly this issue of West Nile prevalence of mosquitoes and abundance of mosquitoes, something about the environmental conditions, how warm it's been, and advising things based on this. So those people didn't just meet once per year, they met on a weekly basis. And they did so because they had to make different decisions in different situations. If it had been a cool, dry year, they might be able to relax a lot. If it's really hot and, and wet, they are going to be very concerned and they might undertake action. So I want to distinguish here between two different types of challenges that confront us when we're making decisions, okay? One of them is we're making decisions about a complex system given some sort of anticipated course of, of important factors outside our control. We plug in values and parameters that we think are fairly representative, and we ask what if questions about different, different possible choices we can make. So here, you know, the focus is centered on building models. They help us characterize the dynamics of the system out there. They help us characterize how that system behaves over time. And we've run many models kind of like this, where there are uncertainties um, that play out over time, but fundamentally the hope is to find kind of a general rule about what, what way of changing things might be the best. So we just deal with kind of an expected course of affairs. The type of decisions we're talking about this summer, the type of challenges, the type of problems we're talking about in this lecture are making complex decisions and choices when we can't anticipate the factors that are going to affect it. And those factors are very, very important in terms of what we should do. So here, we have to focus on the dynamic model, getting that right, yes, but also in adapting our behavior, okay? Um, so we're gonna be focusing on these type two, type B problems. Um, you know, for type A problems, this first type, Really what we're doing is often we are, we have some sort of anticipated course of affairs, we formulate a strategy and we stick to it um, over time. 
uh, we don't have to worry a lot about what unfolds, what situation plays out. We, we simply put in place a plan, and we think that plan is most effective and, and undertake it. For type B problems, these problems that, that involve unfolding uncertainty, that invo where that, unfolds, that uncertainty is very important, rather than you know, putting all our eggs in one basket of a certain plan, we avoid a preset plan and we learn over time. We observe what's going on. What's the temperature like? What's the mosquito population? What's the level of prevalence that we see in those mosquitoes? And we make different choices based on those observations. So here, what we do over time depends on what we observe over time, okay? Um, so the question here is how do we make decisions now when the choice of the best decision even now depends so much on what's gonna play out in the future? How can we make a decision now that might position us best, for example, to make more flexible decisions in the future, that might provide options in the future that otherwise aren't there? How could we decide things now that won't put us in a bad strait if things turn differently than we might expect in the future, that we're not putting ourselves in a vulnerable position? So this involves not just reasoning about choices between policies under some expected case, but dealing with uncertainties about what will be playing out. Um, and to what degree, and this is a key choice, to what degree can we actually make a decision now about what to do and undertake an action now? And to what degree do we have to wait and see? Do we learn? Do we watch for more evidence before making, making a choice about what, what decision to make or about what a action to take? So when to take action is, is a key issue, okay? Um, so, you know, here we're balancing two desires. Number one, a desire to seize the moment, act early. Stitching time says nine. We saw this a few lectures ago with lock-in effects, that if we act early, we can head off problems that are a lot harder to resolve once they become established. So we saw a case, for example, where if we acted really early, we could nip something in the bud with minimal effort. If we waited, it might take a lot more effort to deal with it. You know, it, it's, it's become a much worse problem by then. So we're balancing the desire to nip it in the bud with the desire to wait and see and learn. The desire to learn over time what's going on and to figure out more judiciously, do I really need to take action or can I, can I just hold off in the case of West Nile? Okay, so what decision we make at a particular point in time depends on our current situation, yes, what we've observed happening to this point, but also possible future eventualities what might happen over the next few years. So, um, for example, I work with a major city here in Canada, outside the province, um, that was uh, very concerned about future eventualities for their planning. So they wanted to do city planning within their boundaries to, to improve quality of life, um, improve the accessibility of housing for people within the city and so on. But they didn't just want to undertake that planning with respect to you know, the anticipated course of affairs over the next bunch of years. The anticipated employment rate, the anticipated interest, interest rate, et cetera. They wanted to undertake that taking into account a broad set of uncertainties, including uncertainties about the economy uncertainties about oil prices, um, which might affect their economy in big ways, okay? Um, so here, they wanted to take into account planning, yes, make better choices, but in light of the fact that we don't know what's gonna happen two years from now, three years from now, the economy could tank. Um, and uh, because of a downturn in industry, we end up being in a lot more of a tight financial situation. What should we do now to, to position ourselves so we're less vulnerable to that sort of future shock? 
And this again is balancing this desire. Desire to act now, head things off, versus this desire to kind of let's wait and see until we see if it's needed. Okay, so a few characteristics of these adaptive decision problems. We can't count on one trajectory playing out. We have to deal with a variety of possible trajectories. Choosing decision now requires not just looking at what's happened till now, but what could happen in the future. And we need to make decisions over time as things unfold, rather than make our choice up front and just sticking to it, okay? And reflecting the fact that it may be advantageous sometimes to defer our decision until more information comes in. So in order to solve these sort of problems, the framework that we've advanced, and it's a framework I think uh, that is not, not perfect, that has a number of limitations, but, but it has some strengths to it, is to combine a simulation model like we've been learning about in this class with what's called the decision tree. And the decision, a decision tree is a very useful construct that is used to reason about choices under uncer unfolding uncertainty, uncertainty over time in light of consequences that play out if you decide one way or the other under a certain event. So here, I'm just giving you this interaction between a simulation model on the one hand and a decision tree on the other, where the simulation model is going to simulate consequences for particular scenarios, and the decision tree will inform the simulation model about possible events and decisions. So we're going to introduce here decision trees as a construct, as a modeling construct. And it's a somewhat it's a somewhat dynamic modeling context in this uh, construct in the sense that it characterizes decisions and uncertainty, unfolding uncertainty over time. But it's not a simulation model. But it's a useful reasoning construct, okay? We're going to use it to diagrammatically illustrate decision making with uncertainty and, and quantitative reasoning associated with that. And these decision trees are going to represent a flow of time, choices over that time, and uncertainties that, that play out, and consequences. Now, I'd like to see a show of hands here, because how much I go into detail with this will, present, will, will depend on how many people have studied decision trees in other classes. So how many people here have studied decision trees in another class? Okay, a fair number. So uh, is this 317? Or 306? Interesting, okay. Is it, uh, so does 317 these days cover decision trees at all? Yeah. yeah, a little bit? Okay, so you've seen some of that. Okay, great. So how many people have not seen decision trees before? Okay, a fair number, okay. So what I'm going to do is I will introduce decision trees um, uh, based on that. I want to bring everyone else along. Um, and for some of you, it will be review. For others of you, it will be new. Um, and uh, hopefully for those for whom it's, it's a review, it will bring back a lot of, a lot of the recollection of the, uh, of the quantitative features of these. Okay, so decision trees. Um, actually exists in a fairly wide variety. It's supported by today's software, um, software such as uh, TreeAge. But um, we're going to confine ourselves to a very simple sort of characterization of decision trees that involves three types of nodes in decision trees. So we're going to draw out a decision tree over time. So there's some well-defined sort of timeline associated with it. And it's going to be a tree in a computer science in a computer science sense. So there's a root, and it's going to be branching, right? There's no cycles in the tree, and there's a defined directionality associated with it. So you have parents and children, and the parents are always going to be earlier than the children. And there's going to be three types of nodes. So we start with the root node, and there's going to be three types. The first of the nodes is a decision node. And this represents a set of possible choices, okay? Set of possible choices here. Um, so we may have something like this. And this decision node um, 
is associated with a choice at a certain time. So this is time here, right? Um, and there's a set of possibilities that are enumerated here. They are discrete in nature. By discrete, I don't mean that they're private or secret, but I mean instead that they are countable. Um, there's clear distinctions between them, they're not continuous. Um, so you have a set of choices. Maybe one of the choices is to do nothing, one of the choices, and wait and see, one of the choices is to uh, issue an advisory, one of the choices is to undertake larviciding or adult deciding. Um, the actions involving um, uh, chemical agents that can, can kill off mosquitoes at different stages of the development. So that's a decision node, and it has children associated with it, which each of which represents one choice. Okay? Secondly, is a choice node. Note that for a decision node, we choose what to do. This is gonna be key. For a chance node, and unfortunately, uh, there's, there's green, there's green. Um, green is the color. Um, Okay, so here we go. Um, so a chance node represents an uncertain event, an event over which you have no control. It's an event that occurs because of some phenomena outside of your ability to, to directly alter, and there can be several outcomes for it. But because it's outside of your control, in contrast to, decision, uh, to decisions, um, we can't elect which of these we undertake. And so instead of that, we associate a probability obtaining for this particular node of, of um, each, each branch of this. So we'll associate a probability of each outcome. Does the decision node have a probability associated with it? Each, each outcome? No, it's a choice we make. So we is not foisted upon us. We're not rolling the dice here. We're making a choice there. We have to make one of these choices. They are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Okay, the set of choices here. If we make choose one, we don't choose the other. We have decided, we have cut off the others. Events, here, one of these events will occur, and which one, we're not sure. Um, they'll occur with a certain probability. The final type of node that we will illustrate in our decision trees is what's known as a terminal node. So somewhere down here, there are terminal nodes, and they are traditionally represented with uh, triangles. Um, and they're associated, importantly, with a type of information about the consequence, okay? So maybe this consequence is in terms of number of, of, of people that are likely to get West, uh, come down with West Nile fever, or maybe it's associated with the number of people that die from West Nile, maybe it's associated with costs, associated with the uh, foreign by the, the healthcare system and by interventions against West Nile, but it's associated with some number. It's a, co it's a, it's a consequence, okay? So they're so associated with consequences. Okay, so we can draw out these decision trees over time, and a very common goal for the decision tree is to take a decision tree and try to come up with a maximally desirable decision rule, okay? What do I mean by a decision rule? Especially, especially the cohort here who have seen decision trees before. What do I mean by a decision rule? Sometimes use, the term is used strategy in certain sub-areas of the literature. So in order to achieve a specific outcome, we need to go back in time and figure out what actually took place. Okay, but good. Then get it from the end to the start. Okay, so, so I like that. You have to figure out what path you want to take. Some elements of that path, though, are up to you. You can choose for a decision which way you want to make it, and that's most key. That's what we're hoping to get. But you don't always know 
which decisions will be handed for you. For example, it may be that you know, this decision you know you're always going to need to make. But some of these branches might involve subsequent uh, decisions and others not, for example. Okay. So sometimes what decision you make, or maybe you have each of them involves a choice, but which choice you take here may be very different from the best choice to take here. So this is going to be a decision rule. Is yes delineating a sort of uh, choices we want to make, but it's doing so under all possible situations, all situations that nature might hand you, given the uncertainties involved, okay? So here, it's not a matter of simply saying, which choice do we make initially? We want to figure out, for all of the, the decision notes in this diagram, which can be reached, what's the choice that we should make if we reach that point? So. It's kind of thinking through, if this happens, I'll do this. If that happens, I'll do that, okay? And it turns out that there is an algorithm for, for deciding these things, okay? Um, these decision trees can often be quite large. Um, this is one we created uh, for, um, for West Nile virus uh, some, some years back, involving uncertainties uh, about temperature regimes here and uh, choices at different points in time. These are weekly choices as to what decisions uh, to make. And this tree involved uh, thousands, uh, thousands of um, consequence nodes that need to be evaluated. Okay, so let's talk about uh, some of this decision making. So suppose we have a decision tree here. This is associated with, with uh, software development. Um, and we have a choice early on, okay, to what degree are we going to undertake software? Um, so a new version of the Mac OS is gonna come out. Um, to what degree are we going to, within our software program, um, rely on the new OS features, which will make it especially um, favorable and for certain, um, certain elements of that software? Um, and to what degree will we avoid relying on those features, but end up having to put in sort of substitutes that are less aesthetically pleasant. So here we have a, a choice whether to rely on them or not. Maybe we won't exclusively rely on them, but the point is that uh, should we include support for them or not? And the challenge here, the uncertainty is, we're not sure whether the OS will be delayed or shipping on time. And if it ships on time, that's great. We're relying on these features, the program we've released has these features well supported in it, and we may reap greater sales of our product because it's really slick on this new release of the, of the OS. But if the OS is delayed, in order to release our program, we're gonna have to wait until, until we can get a, a feature, feature complete version of the OS. We're gonna have to wait until we can get a version of the OS that we can really test against with reliability and it may cost us in terms of the ship date of our product, and so we may lose customers. So here, these, these consequences are born if we're relying on the new OS features. On the other hand, we cannot rely on them, and we'll say that, you know, we'll view that as the baseline, as kind of the reference case. Um, we'll treat it as sort of a cost of zero. So here, we will gain, gain uh, from the situation compared to the baseline. Here, we will lose from the situation compared to the baseline. And we'll associate a subjective probability. We're not sure what this probability is, but we might ask, we might say, we think 90% chance based on Apple's past releases that it'll ship on time or ship within you know, a certain window and 10% chance it would ship without. So here's the question. So is it desirable to rely on these features or not given this situation? How would you figure that out? Yes. How much loss can you absorb? What risk are you willing to assume? Okay, so you're getting into a more tricky issue associated with what's called risk preferences. Um, and the nature of my ability to tolerate risk and to tolerate loss of money compared to the gain of money, for example. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole literature um, which was contributed to by an early computer scientist. Incidentally, one of the first to work with cellular automata, John von Neumann, 
who also gave his name to the von Neumann architecture that many of you learned about in 215. Um, and it's an, it's an interesting issue. It turns out that some people, there's no right answer for this. Some people are more risk averse than others. Some people are better able to tolerate loss of, of funds compared to others. If you're someone, if you're someone who's incredibly wealthy, um, it may be that losing $100 is a minor matter. Losing $10,000 is a minor matter. For those in the room, and I think faculty are included here, <laughs> you know, losing $10,000 is not a minor matter. For some of you, it could be life-changingly catastrophic. Um, at this phase of your life. So, so there, is, there is an issue there of, of risk preference. We're not always risk neutral when it comes to, you know, if we had a game where with 50% chance you win $11,000 and 50% chance you lose $10,000, uh, how, how many of you would be willing to play that game? Okay, <laughs> so Alex is 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 uh, is willing. How many others? Fifty percent chance you win uh, eleven thousand dollars. Fifty percent chance you you lose ten thousand dollars. How many people are willing to play that game? How many times do we have to play it? <laughs> once. <laughs> once. Just once. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So a couple of people are willing to play. Um, why might you be willing to play that game? Expected value. How much would you gain on average from playing? Down thousand Okay, so so I'll repeat the number. So eleven thousand you win. Uh, and 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 ten thousand if you lose, each with fifty percent chance. So so expected value, right? You remember this from what is it? Uh, from from math uh, math two forty five? Statistics stats two forty five, is that right? Yeah. So how do I do expected value? Okay. So we'll consider the sample space. There's two possible outcomes, right? Each with fifty percent probability. One at fifty percent probability. So remember, expected value is is x times the probability of that of x happening, right? Um, so x here is ten thousand with 50% probability that it will happen plus 50% probability, I'm putting the P of X first here, times 11,000, right? Sorry, sorry, this is minus 10,000, right? Okay, so, so what, do we, what do we have here? W what we have is, well, you can, this is equal to 0.5 times 1,000, right? Just the difference between these two, right? Which is 500. So on average, you make $500 with that gamble. But why wouldn't most of you want to play? Because you don't have $10,000 to lose. So yeah, winning $11,000 is real good. But losing $10,000 right now is, is unthinkably bad suddenly you're down $10,000. So it's a lot worse. What matters that this loss of $10,000 may, may affect your satisfaction in life a lot more than this gain of, of $11,000. It's not, it's not worth it to you. And there's a whole theory associated with that. Here, we're gonna analyze it purely in, in numeric terms. In term, if this were a company run by Larry Ellison or Bill Gates, um, Tim Cook, um, folks who who have deep pockets, Sergey Brin. Um, which of these would be the most favorable thing to come from? Rely on the new. Sorry. Rely on the new OS. Okay, rely on the new OS, and 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 why is that? What's the expected gain here? Thirty-five thousand. Okay, good. So, so if we were to choose this option. We would have an expected outcome of okay, um, 0 0.1 times 
and that's uh, 200,000, right? 200,000, um, and we'd have plus 0.9, so this is minus 200,000, excuse me again, times 5,000, right? Right? 50,000, 50, thank you, thank you. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what do we have here? We have 45,000 here, right? And we have minus 20,000 here, right? And on average, the sum up to 25,000, right? As the, the expected gain compared to zero. So here, you stand to gain 25,000 on average, expected value here relative to zero. So if you were risk neutral, if you didn't, if, if uh, you know, the, the, th this, um, every dollar in this counted for the same amount as every dollar in that, you would, you would end up preferring this. You'd on average gain money by, by preferring that. So, so here we could do the calculation, $25,000 for this option, $0. So we'll choose this option. We cut off this option and hence the, the kind of cut there that's, that's shown. So the algorithm here um, for this is based on what's called dynamic programming, Bell's, uh, Bellman's principle. Uh, it's called rollback. It's called backwards induction. It goes by different names. The basic algorithm here is quite simple. Uh, for terminal nodes, nodes at the end of the tree, you simply pass up the value. The value for that node is the value with which it's associated. For event nodes, you pass up the expected value. That's what we are computing here. So a node like this, we pass up the expected value. And that's, that's what I computed, right? 25,000. That's the value associated with this, um, with this here. And finally, for decision nodes, you select whichever child offers the best value. Now, what it means to be best will differ from decision if what's associated with the terminal nodes of the decision tree is cost, you'd want the one with the minimal value. If, it's, if they're associated with deaths, you want the one with the minimal value. On the other hand, if the, if, the, if the consequence nodes are associated instead with profit, you want the maximum value. So here you're selecting whichever child offers the best value, and you pass that value up. Okay, so decision nodes, terminal nodes, and um, and leaf nodes, each have a rule associated with them, and we can compute. Okay, so here's another example. It's an expanded one here where if the OS is delayed, you can make a decision, okay, do, are we gonna ship without the final of the release of the OS being available? We'll take our chances and we'll assess, okay, with 93% chance, probably the feature support will be suitable and we'll be fine. We'll, we'll limit our loss because we chip early, or seven percent chance we assess that there's uncaught bugs in this in the in the new OS release. We didn't wait for the very final testing version. We used release candidates to to sort of judge the suitability of our software, and as a result, with a seven percent chance, we may miss some some issue that causes uh, causes the need for patches and extra cost. So here, we can still not rely on new OS features, or we can rely on these. And then if the new OS ships in, on time, we don't have to make this decision. But if the new OS is delayed, we're going to make this decision. And then we're exposed to this uncertainty. So here's the question. Here's the question. Um, uh, so what is the best decision rule here? What's the most favorable decision rule? How would we compute this? Um, yeah. Good. Okay, I think that's negative two million. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Multiply yeah, multiplied by that. Okay, yeah, yeah so 14,000, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and then multiply this by that, yeah. Okay. And is there Good. Less, yeah, is there less than negative two hundred thousand cool. than you need that? 
Yeah. Um, uh, okay, then we make that decision. And then what do we do for this? What do we pass up for this one? Uh, whichever. Okay, so this is this is going to be minus one hundred forty-seven thousand, one hundred forty rather, one hundred forty uh, thousand. This is going to be minus. Let's that's uh, minus ninety-three thousand, right? So, so we could uh, so multiplying multiplying those by each other and then summing them up, right? Um, okay, so. Um, uh, minus uh, minus uh, two thirty three thousand. Uh, okay, and and then we're going to compare that to this. Okay, this guy is, is has a more negative value than this guy. So which guy? Which way are we going to choose? More negative value. Negative negative. Negative almost less negative. Ne less negative. Okay, the less bad one. We'll choose that, and then we have. And so that's the value of this node, and then we have a 0.1 chance of that applying, 0.9 chance of that applying. We're going to need to multiply 0.1 times that, 0.9 times that, add them up to get the expected value for this guy, and then we're going to choose accordingly. And so naturally, this is not the best thing to do in your head, so um, we can use a computer to do it, right? So here, minus 233, and this one, this one's more favorable, so we're going to choose this way if we get to this point. Note that we didn't necessarily get to this point. If we had chosen this way at first, we wouldn't be here. We would have no choice. Uh, we have no issue of having to choose this. But in this case, we, we, we will compute it on the way up, and only then we'll decide which way to decide up here. Which is the way we're deciding up here? Which, which is the, the way that we'll decide up here? So give me the decision rule here. Play, give me the decision rule in English, please. How would you phrase this in English, the decision rule? Maximum return. Okay, so secure the maximum return. That is, that is indeed what's going on here. We're operating purely in terms of returns financially. But can you phrase the decision rule as a set of contingent statements? If this happens, we're going to do this. Otherwise, we'll do that. What's what's the basic statement here? If we make more money by relying on the control at least on average, we still have that. Okay, let's 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 say we've done this analysis. So I appreciate that effort. Let's suppose we do this analysis, and this is the result. What would you advise someone who's in this situation? If this is if this is the sum total of the reasoning they want to rely on, what would you advise them that they should do? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the decision so rule. Relationships on time. Okay. Oh, okay. But first, they should rely on the new OS yes. features, right? Do rely on the new OS features. If the new new OS trips the time, you're golden. Yeah. That's fine. If it's delayed, then what should they do? Then we should wait for the OS release for regression. For the regression test. test. That's right. Um, don't don't ship it. You know, ship it otherwise um, without the final release. That's right. So that's a decision rule because it involves dealing with contingencies. You know, if this happens, we're going to do this. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll we'll uh, we're not exposed to that at, at all. So here, a decision rule involves not just a statement you will do this in an unconditional fashion. It's actually a conditional statement. In these conditions, you'll do this. In these other conditions, you'll do that. Um, so decision trees can be used to identify optimal decision rules, optimality in light of the, the simplified assumptions of these rules. And so a decision rule specify what we should do in any possible eventuality. If this happens, you'll do this. If this happens, you'll do that. So we might diagram a larger diagram like this, a, di a, a larger decision tree like this here. You know, we'll have decision nodes and event nodes and terminal nodes down here. And what we decide at a given point in time, let's say this point in time, will be different depending on how we got there. So we have the same choices here, 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 and here. But we'll make different choices uh, depending on what's happened to this point. So in this case, this is, this is for example, a... Um, a particular scenario here where we make this choice, we, this thing happens, we make this choice, this thing happens, 
and we have a consequence. A decision rule, that's a particular scenario. Uh, a decision rule might look something like this. This is a static decision rule. Static, why do I say this is static? Why is that static? No, it's not because there's only one instance of it for the whole class. Why is this static? Why do I say it's static? Do you notice a certain pattern at these decision points? Time is going on here, but what's What's, what's fixed? It's static in the sense that you're undertaking, at a given time, you're undertaking some pre-specified action. So at this, this time, week one, we are doing nothing. At this week two, we are larvicidic. No matter how we get to these points, we're undertaking the same action. That's a decision rule. By the way, why is this whole area blank down here? Why, why is there no path shown? Why, why is there, like you may say, well, I don't see a, I don't see something that you know, indicates a larva siding uh, here or here. What, why is that? Well, yeah, I mean, this is a decision rule because I'm saying if I reach this point, I'm going to decide this way. So I don't have to deal with what, how I decide here. This, this is not possible. I'm not going to get here because I've headed that off. I've decided there to go do this. And so I, I don't have to deal with this at all. So th this is a decision rule that's complete. It specifies under any possible, I know possible, eventuality um, what I'm going to do. This is not a possible eventuality because I know if this happens, if I have a high temperature here, I'm going to do nothing. I, I just know that ahead of time. It's static because I'm always at the same point in time, I'm undertaking a pre-specified action. It's fixed. It's fixed in the sense that it's pre-specified at this time, I will do X. Here I'm doing X at this time. Here I'm doing Y at this time, but it's all specified. It doesn't depend on the contingencies. It doesn't depending on what temperature was observed in the past week or the past two weeks. It's all fixed. Okay, so that's a static decision rule. This is an adaptive decision rule. Why is it adaptive? Give me a sort of a, a, a hallmark of it being adaptive. What's adaptive about it compared to this guy? This guy is, I'd say, is static. This guy is adaptive, why? It's changing. It's it's dynamic in a sense. What's that? Yeah, I mean, um, related. Yeah, you you might say that depending on how I interpret that, that that could be true. So there's going to be there's going to be sometimes, for example, where this path is explored, sometimes where that path is explored. But the the main point here is that that. What you decide here depends on what you've observed previously. It's not the previous one. We had whether this week was hot or hot or cold, we're going to make the same decision regardless. This next tree, we're going to make a different decision. If, if this has been a cool week, we'll do nothing. If this is a hot week, we will undertake larvicide. There it's an adaptive decision rule. What action we undertake is contingent. It's contingent on what has happened. It's contingent on what we've observed. It's contingent on these events that are outside of our control, but the action we take to respond to it is under our control. And the action we take is different, depending on what's happened. Here we're actually undertaking the same action there, but this is an aspect of, a, of an adaptive decision rule. It's something that responds differently under the different, um, the different context. So a static decision rule pursues the same predetermined decisions regardless of eventualities. It's predetermined in the sense for a given time it's specified what you will do. This is a fixed plan. We stay the course. No matter what happens, 
you know, after this, we're going to undertake the same action here. It doesn't matter what's gone on recently. This, by contrast, is a case where we are, we are responding differently under different conditions. We are adapting our behavior based on what we've learned, what we've observed, and undertaking different actions accordingly, okay? Um, And there are some important cases where what we decide early actually opens up new possibilities for how we could decide later, which is really interesting. You give yourself options for the future in case you need them. You get in place flexibility in case you need it so that you're less exposed later. It's not that you definitely will need it, it's just if you do, it'll be a huge help. Okay, so adaptive decision rules are, are often, um, often uh, very favor, favored in terms of their ability to, to secure better outcomes because you can shield yourself from adverse situations by reacting uh, differently. And some of the decisions you take into account early um, or that you put into place early may be motivated by the, desi by the desire to put you in a better situation later. If this happens, I'll be in a better, better situation. So let's talk a little bit about this. So analysis using decision trees is, is powerful. So basically, um, within decision, tr uh, decision tree analysis frameworks, we, um, we can undertake some pretty interesting types of, uh, of analysis beyond just computing the uh, desired decision rule. That's one of the favorite ones. But additionally, we can add symbolic computations to the, the tree to expand the power. And you can identify, for example, how sensitive your choice of decision making is to certain um, probabilities uh, within the tree. You can decide the value of information. How much would it be helpful for me to collect more information on this uncertainty so I can make better decisions? How much would that pay off? Um, and you can make, uh, make improved uh, strategy decisions. So for example, we could here include in the decision tree an analysis that will have two variables, like our assumption about how late the OS, the probability that OS will be late, or the probability that um, there's a surprise uh, that um, there's an issue in the last version of the OS that wasn't there in the release candidates. And then we could do an analysis here, which basically tells us, okay, for what assumptions about these probabilities is it desirable to rely on new OS features, features versus to not rely on them, okay? So within this kind of space, this is kind of a probability space, this is the assumption about the probability that the final version of the OS will have a surprise in it in terms of revealing a bug associated with our system um, that wasn't revealed in the release candidate. Here's the probability the OS will be late. And what this is saying is basically, well, what is this saying? Can anyone read that? What, what, what would that be telling us? Yeah, so, so if, if I'm in this region here, it's saying it's better, it's actually better, more favorable um, um, to rely on new OS features, all right? Um, by contrast over here, if, if there's a high probability the OS is late, or there's a, and there's a, somewhat of a higher probability that there'll be a surprise in the last version of the OS. Under those conditions, I'd, I would shy away from relying on the new OS features in my development plans. So this is doing the sensitivity analysis here, you know, associated with, with this node up here. How should I decide up here um, uh, will be, will be uh, different depending on my uncertainty, on my sort of sense of the probabilities of each of these. And uh, what this is telling me is it may be, if I think it's very likely that you know we're down here in this area of the quadrant, 
probably a pretty robust strategy to rely on the NOAA's features. So I'm not right on the edge of where it will be favorable. So we can do those sort of um, uh, analyses. It turns out with these sorts of trees, we can also do work to take into account multiple attributes. So it's not just cost, but it's also um, uh, health outcomes, or it may be outcomes associated with, um, uh, with quality of life or, or what have you. Okay. Um, uh, now, I wanted to talk about, though, having had this sojourn into decision trees, I want to talk about how they relate to dynamic models. In this case, we're going to be using this example of the system dynamics model. So the idea here is to combine decision trees on the one hand with simulation models using each for its own area of strength. Um, so the idea here is was illustrated earlier, but um, uh, I want to I want to make it more specific. So the idea here is that the simulation model and the decision tree each have a realm of where they are responsible for the issues. And for simulation models, the job of the simulation model in this pairing is being going to be calculating the dynamic consequence of a particular scenario. So you may remember my scenario in the diagram, what I meant by a scenario. It was, it was this. This is a particular scenario. It's a sequence of decisions and events over time. And we're going to use the simulation model to calculate the consequence here. So if, if this thing happens early, and then we see this, and that thing, and then we choose this, and then this thing happens outside of our control, what will be the consequence, right? So if we decide, for example, early on to undertake do nothing, and then it's a high temperature scenario, and then we decide larviciding, and then it continues to be a hot, a hot summer, what's the consequence of the number of mosquitoes in terms of, or in the number of West Nile cases? That would be something the simulation model would be responsible for, consequent, uh, for, for simulating. It simulates out this particular scenario and gives a consequence uh, based on that. Okay? Um, uh, it takes care of deterministic situation given events and decisions. Right? Um, the decision tree here, by contrast, represents over time sequences of decisions and uncertainties. And basically, it, it is used to do the rollback. It's used to identify the most favorable scenario given the assumptions. And it basically encapsulates all the decision, all the uncertainties, and the choices to be made. So the decision tree is used here to, to represent this space. And the simulation model is used to evaluate the consequence for each of these decision modes. Now, so doing, then we can use rollback once the simulation model is given a consequence for all of these. We can do rollback from the bottom to the top to identify which decision rule is most desirable. We figure out for each possible decision point, each one that's possible in light of our earlier choices, what our, our, our best choice would be advised to be. So here the simulation model is computing these, and the decision tree is allowing us to reason about our choices under uncertainty. So it's saying, essentially, if you see this weather condition, this level of mosquito population, this level of infectivity, um, you should wait and see. This other one, undertake advisory, might say for this other one, undertake larviciding or what have you. So it can give advice at different stages associated with, with this tree, okay? Um, so to be clear here, our decision at a certain point in time, a particular decision node will depend on the current situation, future eventualities that are possible. The fact that later we'll, we'll be able to revisit this choice in another week, for example, right? Um, we, we don't have to decide now for all time. We can defer the decision for another week, for example, but what uh, action to undertake. That's something that we can consider in these trees in our rollback. That's, that's part of the decision. 
And here we're again, this, this framework is implicitly balancing this desire to see the moment as captured by the simulation model, by these lock-in effects we've seen before, where we can head off issues early on that are much harder to, to deal with later, and this wait and see, where we can defer now and, and learn, mo learn more about what's needed, okay? Um, okay, um, so here, decision tree and simulation model, they're paired to compute different aspects of the situation. The decision tree representing uncertainties, consequences, choices, the simulation model allowing us to simulate the effects of particular scenarios where the decision tree can then be used to do the rollback, to sort of figure out what is advised at each possible decision point. So simulation models here, evaluating the consequences associated with these terminal nodes. In traditional decision analysis, the consequences of these terminal nodes are computed in different ways for different trees. For situations where you're dealing with a complex situation where you have feedbacks and delays and nonlinearities, et cetera, it makes eminent sense to compute these with a simulation. That's how you would know what is the consequence of successive weeks of hot weather when you're doing nothing or where you're undertaking larviciding. Larviciding might kill mosquito larvae, but leave those in the air still present. Trying to figure out what that means in terms of number of cases of West Nile versus the situation where we issue an advisory and some number of people exercise greater protection in their clothing in terms of going out at dawn and dusk, et cetera. It's a hard thing to, to do in our heads. So a simulation model can be really effective at allowing us for us to compute these things. And then roll back on the basis of that to identify the best choices of different parts of this tree that one can read. So that's the pairing here, ladies and gentlemen. Decision analysis in the form of decision trees and the algorithms on them and simulation models in the form of computing the consequences to particular scenarios. Together, they form a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts um, where we can make decisions not only about one situation, about what, what choice is best under one situation, one particular temperature regime, for example, but instead we can make trade-offs between what we should decide under a huge variety of different circumstances, okay? So this is an example of a hybrid technique, hybrid between simulation of different sorts. It could be agent-based, it could be discrete event, it could be system dynamics on the one hand, and on the other hand, hybrid with, uh, with uh, decision trees, okay? So combination of two types of techniques to address this issue that we started with of dynamically complex decision problems. Problems that involve complexity, that involve feedbacks, uh, nonlinearities, delays, um, uh, lock-in effects, uh, path dependence, et cetera, and decision-making against unfolding uncertainty, okay? So that's the combination here. Um, it's our first substantive look at a hybrid model and its consequences. In our next class, we're going to go more systematically through a set of hybrid strategies for combining the types of simulation models we're building in this class. System dynamics, agent-based, and discrete event, combining them together to address different types of questions. And you'll see that what we've thought about is three different modeling paradigms can actually be mixed and matched very easily. And the choice these days is not so much one of which method should I use at all. It increasingly is a matter of which area of my model might be best suited to which method, okay? Um, so often you will have one, a model that incorporates multiple types of modeling 
within its framework and different areas of the modeling will evolve over time, perhaps going from one technique to the other as learning takes place during the modeling process. So first hybrid here, we're gonna go on to that. In our remaining time in this course, we're gonna be spending next week addressing some deeper issues having to do with um, modeling of real world phenomena. We're gonna take a look at state space characterizations and see how time series associated with empirical data, the observations we can collect from things as varied as the stock market or counts of people affected over time or readings from biological instrumentation or what have you, how those time signals can give a hint as to the structure of the system in terms of the number of stocks that might be required to characterize them. So this is using a, a, a notion known as embedding, and embedding theorems. We're gonna take a look to see about how those time series can be used to hint as to the, uh, the nature of the underlying dynamics and the nature of the models that might explain dynamics. We're also gonna go on to talk about the role of dimensionality in modeling and how once again, we can get insights into the nature of the processes that must be involved in explaining uh, uh, the, 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 um, the observations we make in the world based on reasoning about dimensions involved. And how using simulation models, we can cross check our simulation models, spot errors in our simulation models by recognizing the dimensions of the quantities involved, okay? So that's the next uh, bunch of lectures uh, for this class. Um, thanks very much for bearing with the, uh, the uh, unexpected uh, technical issues that arose today. I've gotta go talk, Mer talk to Merlin about some, uh, some computer problems and I'll look forward to uh, seeing you on Thursday. Thanks very much.